We'll have the first lecture of the uh, workshop right now, and we have Abhishek Professor Abhishek Parvi from IIT Madras. And before we begin the lecture, may I formally introduce the speaker. Professor Abhishek Parvi is an assistant professor in English at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and the associate fellow of the United Kingdom Higher Education Academy. He is the author of Postmodern Literatures, published by Orion Black Swan in 2018, and Culture and the Literary Matter, Metaphor and Memory, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2022, and is the founding chairperson of the Indian Network for Memory Studies, INMS. He has been awarded the Meenakshi Mukherjee Award for the best published paper in 2019 by the Indian Association of Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies, and has also contributed a critical biography on Jhumpa Lahiri for the Indian Writing in English online website. I hope all of you would check it out. And uh, more importantly, the last time Professor Parvi was here, uh, he conducted a workshop on memory studies, and some of us in the audience were part of that, that workshop. And he also delivered a most delightful lecture on Shakespeare's Hamlet the very next day. And some of us were MA students at that time, and we do remember that lecture. So may I now kindly invite Professor Parvi for his lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Atul, for a most kind and warm introduction. It's always a great pleasure to be back here uh, in HCU. Uh, it's one of my favorite departments, if I may say so. And uh, I should mention that I've never heard Pramod sound so nice. I mean, this morning, which obviously means he's very happy with his project. I mean, the nicety of Pramod Naya was so obvious with the way he was sort of praising people, appreciating people, without a scatteristic irony. So great, that is August very well for the project, reflects very positively on how the project is going. And I do sincerely believe this is not just an academy project. I think it's also a cultural project. Uh, you know, because what we are seeing here is something historical, something cultural, and something profoundly urgent. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, compiling everything uh, in this IWB banner is something which should have been done, I think, ages ago. But I'm so glad that arguably the best department in the country in English is doing this. So congratulations to the organizers, to the IOA team. And of course, I am absolutely certain this project will flourish and will become you know, a benchmark as well as some kind of a you know, virtual encyclopedia uh, in this particular domain in the times to come. So I've been entrusted with opening this uh, event, which is a little bit daunting, not least because it's an unfamiliar architecture to me. It's grander, bigger. Uh, compared to the uh, English department, where I'm more familiar, more cozy and more intimate, but I will do my best to open up what should be a, a fascinating event. So I have been uh, invited formally to talk about partition, you know, partition literature, uh, especially from uh, the, uh, you know, the perspective of this particular project. So what I will do first uh, is look at the theory of narration in terms of how uh, one can look at literature as a medium, and that's something I'm very interested in uh, academically, uh, looking at the, the ontology of literature. So what is literature? What is special literature? What, why should we study literature at all when we are looking at a complex political uh, uh, movement? Because surely there are so many other ways one can represent politics. I mean, there's photography, there's cinema, uh, there's you know, radio, all kinds of things uh, pop up in mind. So what is it about literature which has which has enabled it to survive uh, the, the sort of encroachment of technology. Because uh, if you remember, uh, you know, literature had a moment of panic around the early, 19, uh, early 20th century when something called cinema was coming into being. And of course, Virginia Woolf wrote this sort of knee-jerk essay called Cinema, where she's paranoid. She's saying, oh, we, we're just going to go out of business now because you know, we have the superior medium coming over and it's probably going to take over, etc. But it hasn't happened. We're still reading books we we'll still go to literature uh, when we want to find out more information. Uh, and this is the interesting bit, uh, the, the informative bit about literature. That's something I'll touch upon in a moment. Uh, you know, why should we look at literature, literary writings, literary representations, novels, fictions, uh, short stories, all kinds of genres, when we are looking at a historical event like partition? So what is it that makes it so valuable as a repository of knowledge? So I'll start with a dark, humorous joke, which I'm hoping is familiar to most of you, but I, I will risk repeating it. This is Slavo Zizek uh, writing in this really interesting book called Welcome to the Desert of the Rio, uh, which is a series of very short essays written in the aftermath of 
and where he talks about this. It's a funny story. Uh, of course, it's not funny, it's dark, uh, but he mixes it up uh, with the punchline as well in the end. So it goes like this. This is East Germany before the fall of the Berlin Wall, where anyone who's even suspected of doing any state anti-state activity would be sent to a hard labor camp uh, and obviously be subjected to a lot of painful process. Uh, so one person is about to get arrested and about to get sent off to a hard labor camp. Uh, before he goes, he has his final drink with his buddies and he says, well, I'm going to be away. Uh, I don't know for how long, so I will write letters to all of you. Uh, but because it's a labor camp, they will censor the letters. They will read what I'm writing, right? Because you just can't say anything. So let's establish a code uh, through which we can understand each other. And what is that code? So the code is, if I write a letter to you in blue ink, assume that everything I'm writing is correct, true, right? So I'm saying I'm, I'm fine, this is all very good. In blue ink means it's actually fine, I'm good. However, if I'm writing a letter to you in red ink, just invert what I'm writing. So if I'm telling you I'm fine in red ink, it means I'm probably dying, right? I'm very sick. A month later, his friends receive a letter from him, written in blue ink, where he's saying that, well, this is actually not a bad place at all. Uh, the hard labor camp is not that hard. There's football games, there are, you know, we see cinema at the weekends, um, you know, there's butter and honey and bread. It's actually quite okay. We have everything we need to lead a decent life except one thing. We don't have red ink, right? And the reason why I think this is interesting, and I'm just going to connect this to the relevance of the, sort of the ontology of literature per se, because this little short funny story, which is perhaps entirely something Zizek made up, uh, is also an interesting example of how absence can be political, right? And how it is important to find out what is not there, what is not articulated, what is not said, uh, not out there, right? So, I mean, Zizek obviously uh, uh, stylizes it uh, in a Zizek in way, where he says the, the missing red ink is that agency through which we can articulate our unfreedom. You know, we can tell people how we really are. That's the only agency missing. Everything else, this movie, this football, this uh, butter, honey, whatever. But we don't have that one thing, that one instrument through which we can tell my, our friends and family what we really are, who we really are. And I think literature is a bit like the red ink, right? Because the medium of literature is a great enabler. You know, the medium of fiction, if I should say so, is how we can sort of mix up what really is there with what could have been there, right? So in my book, which is very kindly mentioned by Atul, the Culture of the Literary, I argue exactly this. So why, why do we still have the literary as a big thing in culture? Because it mixes up different cognitive possibilities. It mixes up different ontological possibilities. It can tell you what really was there historically and can problematize that with what could have been there. And I can push a little bit further and also makes another point, what should have been there, right? So what is there, what could have been there, what should have been there? You mix it all up, it's a really complex cognitive framework, which is obviously why uh, books of fiction get banned more often than history books, right? Because if you think about it logically, why would you ban uh, a book which is fictional in quality, right? I mean, it's not saying it's true. Uh, how many of us have heard of history books being banned? I mean, perhaps there are, but you have to research really hard. But, you know, you just mention, you know, fiction books being banned, and you have a dozen names which prop up in mind, from Thomas Hardy to James Joyce, and, of course, the most recent attack on Salman Rushdie. So what is it about uh, fiction which makes it shocking, subversive, moving, effective, etc. And this is my argument, and this is why I think partition literature is such an important cultural uh, uh, engagement with, with this brutal, grotesque violence which happened in our subcontinent, in our part of the world. You know, why should we read partition literature at all? Uh, to understand the, the effective quality about partition. Right? It's not just about the data. We, we all know what happened in partition. 14 million people had to be transported across the borders. Close to 2 million people died. Uh, a barrister from London called Ratcliffe was brought in and given like five weeks to make a map. And then, you know, it's just... Um, and interestingly, the other important data about partition, sometimes we don't realize it, is that the, the final model of partition, the final map of partition, was released two days after the independence. Right. So Pakistan's independence, 14th August, India's 15th August. The final partition 
bit was released on 17th August. It's like an absurd joke, right? Two countries celebrating their independence still don't know the final borders, which was released officially on 17th August. And one of the many reasons why that happened, excuse me for that, uh, is, you know, there, there was this attempt on the part of the people who were causing it to create some kind of a euphoria uh, about independence before the knowledge of partition creeps in. So it was a very effective experiment, you know, make the independence first and the partition can be released later, two days subsequent to that. Now, obviously, the whole idea of the cartographic classification of partition is out there in public domain, anyone can read it. Uh, you know, the whole idea of Ratcliffe being someone who apparently never saw the east of Paris, you know, he was brought in and was given a series of mathematical uh, instruments and maps, and he says, five weeks, okay, uh, do the five weeks thing and go back. And actually, Auden has got a really cheeky poem on partition, where he's, you know, literally lampooning uh, Ratcliffe, W.H. Auden, it's just called partition where he says that this barrister came in and he was giving maximum security because then otherwise he'd get shot. And then he was just doing five weeks and then he got back and to London and like all good barristers, forgot about the case, right? He was a barrister, literally. So he had to go back to London and forget about the case. Just moves on, a new case comes on. But you know, we also know that apparently when he found out so many people got killed, he gave back his 40,000 rupees or 3,000 pounds, which he got. And he tore up the document. It was probably an act of remorse. We never know that. But you know, these, this is not what we're talking about here, right? This is something we all know. You know, the date, the numbers, the you know, putting a number to violence. How many people got killed on this side and that side? Uh, you know, the cartographer, Mountbatten, Jinnah, Nehru. I mean, these are this is historical data. We all know that. So why should we read literature? to have a more effective engagement with this you know, grotesque form of violence. And this is what my argument is. Because if you read uh, the major literary works uh, about partition, you know, starting from, let's say, Kushman Singh, right down to Shanwa Singh Bolden. Uh, and of course, we, I'm aware that we are just looking at the IWE. I'm quite aware of the E bit. Uh, but of course, there's a ton of literature written in regional languages and I'm speaking in Mounto tomorrow as well, who wrote in Urdu and got translated much later. We find that you know, these you know, literary representations do something which is more than just literary. And I'm just going to connect it back to something we do in our Center for Memory Studies, which is you know, looking at things which are not remembered. You know, because in memory studies, we actually spend more time, we should actually spend more time on forgetting rather than remembering. Uh, because forgetting, especially at a collective level, is never an innocent phenomenon, right? So there has to be something about the fact that something is getting forgotten. Now, what I will mention is, again, this is data, but I'm going to connect the data to something uh, hopefully effective and political. For the longest time, we knew there was, no, there was no partition museum, right? It was just 2017 that the Punjab government, sorry, brought up a museum uh, very close to the Golden Temple in Amritsar. Uh, and if you go to the website of the Partition Museum, it actually says that this, this is a lacuna, that there was no museum for the longest time. Uh, there's nothing officially uh, storing the artifacts uh, of you know, remnants of Partition, documents about Partition. So the museum actually spells it out in the very website that this is just a shocking absence. But there's no museum of Partition. In fact, one of my very close friends and now collaborator, Aninda Ray Chaudhary, who works in the University of St. Andrews, has published a really interesting essay on this, that why is there no partition museum, right? And one of the arguments Anindya makes, is quite compelling, I think, is the very ontology of the museum, right, is that there's an institutional framework to it, right? There's a status institutional framework which uh, informs the shaping of the museum. So the materiality of the museum uh, is quite institutionalized in certain ways. And what Aninde argues, and I'm with him to a large extent, is that it is actually an embarrassment on the part of the states on either side to remind the generations today that the very formation of the state happened out of this grotesque violence. So we can see how this absence makes a lot of sense, right? How none of the two states would want to remember that, you know, we, we came out the euphoria of nationalism, the euphoria of the nation construct, etc., came out of a very, very violent history, right? So hence that, that sort of the absence of the museum. Now, what I argue in my uh, 
perhaps a, a little bit of a stretched argument, but I do hope this has a little bit of a currency among you, that for the longest time, literature was a museum, right? The, the literary representations of partition was the affective museum, the moving museum, the, the museum that moves uh, with you as well as moves you, right? And that is what I think the, the political, cultural uh, significance of literature comes into being. It tells us stories about partition. Because if you look at the Partition Museum today, you know, the way it is, uh, it's actually a wonderful work. It's set up by the Punjab government. And I do recommend if you, if you get a chance to visit it physically, do go. But I think they also have a virtual tour. If you go to the website, I think you can sign up for it. And they are quite clear in terms of looking at the oral narratives. right? So they, you can see how they're taking a, a sort of a non-institutional stance. In, in terms of looking at the stories of the common people, the sufferers, uh, the artifacts, the, the, the daily artifacts, the materials used by people, the utensils, the pieces of clothes, the letters, etc. And what that does, I think, at a very epistemic level, is it brings to the very foreground the experiential quality of partition. Rather than looking at partition as a grand political makeover, as a grand political reconstruction, a cartographic reconstruction, what this museum does is what literature has been doing for the longest time. It's making us aware of the common man. It's making us aware of the everydayness of that entire you know, episode, the, the experiential trauma, the viscerality of the trauma, right? You sort of remember it through your body. So, you know, Shama Singh Baldwin's novel is actually called What the Body Remembers, the embodied trauma of partition. So my argument here is, uh, and I do apologize if it's a tall claim, is the literature was the museum of partition for the longest time. The novels written, the sort of tons of novels written in English as well as in regional languages, was that museum that you went to if you wanted to know about partition, if you wanted to be moved by the horror, the trauma of partition. Right? And if you look at the kind of novels which are written, and this is where, again, literature comes in as a very complex cognitive category. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a novel or a short story or anything written in that literary medium, which has a black and white depiction of partition. I mean, I at least don't know of any novel or any short story, anything written in the zone of literature, which are saying, uh, you know, X is bad, Y is good, X killed, Y died, right? So the mathemat mathematical quality of the violence is entirely done away with, right? Instead, what we get uh, is that the human suffering of partition, the humanity of partition. And of course, you know, the moment we, we start touching about these things, it becomes a bit of a thorny subject, because uh, we have someone like Adorno, uh, who very clearly stated you know, there can be no poetry after Auschwitz. Uh, it is barbaric to write poetry about uh, after Auschwitz, etc. So again, we were looking at the moral relevance of literature as well. But I think Adorno's position was very different. I mean, he's sort of misquoted as well. Uh, you know, and that's something which we keep encountering when we look at, when we're making the argument that literature can be a very compelling representation of trauma, horror, etc. There will always be someone in the audience who will say, hey, but Adorno said that. Right. Well, Adorno never said that there's no poetry after Auschwitz. If you read his German translation, it's actually saying it's barbaric to write lyric after Auschwitz. Of course, he retracted that also, which is something which is less known. He retracted that later. Uh, so anyway, but I think uh, we, we're looking at literature as this rich repository of knowledge, a uh, rich repository of information, not in terms of data, the affective information about partition, right? So you can look at information as being effective in terms of 40 million, 2 million, uh, how many people died, etc. but also the affective information, what really happened emotionally, right? What really happened experientially, right? So this is a bit which makes literature uh, potent, which makes literature uh, moving, which also makes literature subversive, and sometimes a problem uh, you know, from an institutional standpoint, uh, because literature can remind you of things which are best left forgotten. Right? Literature can remind you. So this is a museum bit that I just mentioned uh, at the beginning. The entire um, retelling of a story, in a way, which is a fluid museum. And you know, these days, we have a lot of really interesting work, uh, you know, technologically speaking, on. AR, VR, augmented reality, how we can stylize reality, bring it up. But I always made this argument, we always had that, you know, and that was called fiction, right? Uh, augmenting reality was always there. I mean, uh, you know, you can just go back to Plato, and the entire problem of Plato is that, you know, th these are people who can augment reality. 
who can stylize reality and then cause a problem, right? So it is nothing new. It's just we have a different medium with fancy names and tools and machines. But fiction has always been the great augmentation of reality, right? The great defamiliarization of reality and the great retelling of reality. So partition literature as a genre, I think is, is again, like this particular project, it's not just about the literary bit. It's not just about uh, what is being, what is enjoyable as a literary discourse, etc. It's also a very urgent reminder of things which have been systematically forgotten, things which have been pushed into a collectively produced amnesia. Right? Again, I'm using some a uh, little bit, you know, maybe a bit uh, provocative terms, but you only have to read uh, someone like Milan Kundera. Uh, to understand how uh, forgetting can be a manufactured quality, how a uh, state can actually urge you to forget, to unremember, you know, it's probably a better way to put it, to unremember how you can take off figures from history books, how you can take off events from uh, the historical discourse, and then come to a point where generations will not remember what took place. And there are numerous examples historically where these, these experiments have happened, sometimes to great success. Right? Now, literature is that thorny bit. Literature is that bit which can constantly and naggingly remind you not how many people died, uh, not who got sent over where, uh, but the experience of it. Right? And literature can, and, um, and again, one can go back to some very interesting trauma theory model as well. And you know, when you talk about trauma theory, uh, you know, there are two kinds of memory which uh, you know, come into being. And this is, I'm just being a little psycho psychological here. There's this person called Pierre Jeanette, uh, who is sort of a contemporary of Freud, uh, who is credited uh, in terms of coming up with a term called traumatic memory. Now, Jeanette's theory of traumatic memory is quite interesting because he's saying that you know, traumatic memory is non-narrative in quality. You, you can't talk about it. You can't put a narrative to it because it's traumatic. But there is a time, there is a sort of a latency period uh, there is a temporal quality through which traumatic memory can become narrative memory, right? So you begin to narrate about the trauma, and the moment you begin to narrate, you're in the domain of fiction, literature, oral history, you know, whatever name you want to give it. But this narrativity of literature, where you can bring in the emotive quality of an experience of horror, along with the informative quality, is what makes literature a repository of affective information. Right? Because as I said at the very beginning, it can combine what really happened with what could have happened and then mix it up with what should have happened and also what did not happen. The missing red ink, the metaphor of that one thing which is missing, that one thing which is not allowed to be articulated. Right? So what if you can bring it up? What if you can give it a shape? Now this brings me to the other bit that I want to talk about a little bit. Again, slightly theoretical, but I hope this will make some sense, it will have some relevance in the discussion we, we are having now and are about to have in the next couple of days, which is the idea of spectrality, right? Again, and this is connected to what I just said, spectrality. So, and you know, Atul very kindly mentioned Hamlet, uh, I mean, it's just entirely about spectrality, right? Uh, and uh, if I remember, I was making a comparison of, this is a bit of a digression, a comparison of Hamlet and Kabir Singh, wasn't I? Right? So, so sort of saying how Hamlet gets away because it's got better language, could be seen as exposed because it's lumpen or whatever. Right. But anyway, so Hamlet is about spectrality. And you know, and I'm just gonna bring in Hamlet a little deliberately here because sometimes we get carried away as readers of Hamlet and say, Oh, this is just about lovely lines and monologues and a good looking white man on stage. Uh, getting away with misogyny, sexism, serial abuse, etc., etc. But it's also a very strong political play about Scandinavian politics. We have Norway about to, you know, we have a greater military guy, Fortin Brass, about to come and take over, etc. Now, spectrality is important because what we have in that play, I'm just going to bring it back to partition here as well, is we have this, uh, you know, non disappeared figure, the non disappeared political regime, what we say, the non -dis disappeared. Uh, era, which isn't quite gone, but still lingering somewhere, uh, again, very symbolically on the borders between Denmark and Norway. Now, look at the liminality of Hamlet's father's ghost, right? Now, again, what I would argue is that it's literature's business to articulate spectrality, right? And again, spectrality is a very complex cognitive process, a very complex cognitive phenomenon. It's a play between presence and absence. It's a play between what is there 
and what is not there. So it's just some kind of a half presence, not quite gone, but still there. And if you read Kundera, I mean, we, you know, the Book of Laughter and Forgetting, it's entirely about spectrality, how streets have been renamed, buildings have been repainted, uh, you know, everything, there's a big push to move on from the earlier, earlier communist era, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. But we have a spectral presence of some kind of a half architecture, half broken building, uh, half abundant building, which could constantly remind you of what was there. Now, if you read partition literature, you find that there's a huge element of spectrality uh, in terms of the uh, disappeared but not quite disappeared space time, right? And I, we can call it some kind of a chronotopic uh, condition. I mean, Toba texting is entirely about that. I mean, I'll talk about that in more details tomorrow that village which no one quite knows where it is, right? And, and we have those two big grand narratives coming up, India and Pakistan. And um, you just have to fit in, you know, depending on your religious classification. So if you're religion A, you go there. If you're religion B, you go there, etc. And of course, Manto makes it more complex by looking at a mad demography, madmen. Again, so madness becomes some kind of a subversive construct. But what we see literature doing consistently, and the Christian saying, and Sean Singh Baldwin, and Babsi Sidwa, and over and over again, is that it talks about the conditions which are being forced to disappear, but are not quite going away, and being brought back in different kinds of spectral reputations. It's almost Freudian in quality, how the spectral reputation is happening. You know, things, it can be uh, an old patriarch, it can be an old building, it can be an old street, which hasn't quite gone. And also notice how uh, several of partition novels from, uh, you know, Kushan Singh's Train to Pakistan uh, to Toba Teik Singh, they deliberately create fictional spaces, right? Uh, spaces which don't actually exist. Right, so you know, you know, it's a bit like you know Narayan's uh, Malgudi. So you know, you just create a fictional chronotop, which makes it actually more political, right? In terms of how that fictional space becomes a site of struggle, becomes a site of subversion, a site of contestation, etc., the site of coercion, etc. So the fictionality of the space becomes subversive in quality because we have uh, you know the whole idea of partition being uh, two grand narratives of two great nations are about to be formed and all the other spaces have to be subsumed under those grand narratives. So partition literature is a constant reminder of the personal space, right? Partition literature is a constant reminder of the personal memory, the personal prerogative, the personal choice, the personal agency. What happens in human agency when you have two big institutional machines of agency? Operator, right? When you sort of send across the border to this direction, depending on your religion, and across the border in some other direction, depending on your other religion, right? So, what happens to human agency there? And that humanness of that agency is exactly why the fictionality of the space is so potent, so symbolic, so political, and so deliberate. You have a fictional space which don't really exist. And that fictionality of the space gives it more of a fluidity through which subversion, contestation, coercion can be articulated over and over again. Now, if you come to someone like Salman Rushdie, Midnight's Children, again, it's a novel everyone's read, and it deals with partition and the aftermath uh, quite extensively. We have something quite different. You know, this is magic realism. And I sometimes do this uh, interesting uh, counter study of Manto and Rushdie uh, in terms of looking at how you know, diametrically different the narrative styles are. Because if you look at Manto, it's sort of almost semi-journalistic in quality. There's hardly any metaphor in Manto. Uh, the knife is a knife. Uh, the dead body is a dead body. So there's this very dry, abundant quality of Manto's writing. Very minimal, right? very, very minimal. Uh, almost this sort of narrative austerity, shall we say. Right, this con constant resistance towards metaphoricity, this constant resistance towards you know, metaphoric depth, and that's all very deliberate. Right, and if you have Rushdie as a counterpoint to it, we have this metaphoric excess of magic realism, which obviously gives a slightly carnivalesque quality to the entire theater of partition. Right, and I use the word theater quite deliberately because you know even Manto does that. You know, in Toba Teixing, there is this grand theater of partition which is happening. Everything is very performative. The madmen are performing political roles. Uh, someone is performing Jinnah. Someone is performing Nehru. So that's this whole performative quality which is happening in that asylum in Lahore uh, gets played out. 
Now, Rushdie is doing that at a narrative level. So when you come to Midnight's Children, there is this constant play between tragedy and comedy. And we don't quite know whether you're supposed to, you know, laugh at. The novel is so successful and so moving. And it's such a grand novel about, uh, you know, partition, aftermath, right down to emergency. It's just a huge novel, as you all know. Is that it never really takes uh, a binaristic quality. It never really takes a dualistic quality in terms of looking at a clean perpetrator and a clean sufferer, right? So it's never really saying, you know, perpetrator slash sufferer. So this is constant human uh, emotional experiential entanglement which is happening. And this entanglement is a very handy term, and I use it very often uh, in, in um, all kinds of courses, because literature is about articulating entanglements asymmetric entanglements, where you don't quite know who's Hindu, who's Muslim, you don't quite know who is perpetrator, who is a sufferer. We just know there's this human emotion which is getting represented, uh, you know, very viscerally, in a very embodied way, in a very effective way, in a profoundly psychological way, which makes literature uh, such a moving medium, right? Again, I'm using the word moving medium quite deliberately, because I'm very interested in the mediumness of literature, right? So what is it about the medium of literature? Uh, we, we talk about cinematic museum, we talk about, you know, the painting museum, medium, we talk about, you know, all kinds of medium. But there is something, I think this study, we need to do it. It's a very fundamental study, if you think about it. So what is it about that kind of a narrative style? What is it about, what makes the work literary? And then how does the literariness lend itself to complex political movements such as the partition, which, you know, again, is uh, something which... Uh, both nations are uncomfortable to museumize uh, through a you know, physical museum. And like I said, it's only as recent as 2017, 25th August 2017, the government of Punjab actually made an, a partition museum, right? So, you know, if, if you look at this, so what I'm saying is the whole idea of looking at partition literature as an act of remembrance, uh, as an act of preservation. So literature can also be seen over here as some kind of a preservation project. Right? Which is why I think this particular uh, initiative is so phenomenal, because it's actually about the memory of inner writing in English. It's like a rich database through which you know, this you know, project of preservation, so one can say it's a bit like a meta-memory. It's a memory of memories, because right? if you're com compiling literary texts written from different political positions, different perspectival positions, what you're doing is you're creating a metadata. Uh, of something which is already a museum. You're just bringing it together. And I do believe, I mean, coming at it, maybe I'm very biased uh, as a memory studies student, but I do believe this is also a museum, you know, of sorts. It's like a grand, beautiful museum, a fluid medium museum, which is very experiential in quality, immersive in quality, where you can get in, get hyperlinked, and find out all information about, uh, and how this relationality between politics, literature, culture, uh, all come together. So. Standing here, as we do in 2022, uh, the literature of partition, I think, is an important project of remembrance, which for the longest time uh, was standing in, you know, in, in place of a real museum. And now we have a real museum. But then again, we have the literary artifacts. And what we're looking at here, just like utensils and clothing and you know, stationary, uh, literary text should also be considered as artifacts. Right? These are artifacts of remembrance. Uh, you know, so whether you're writing from a position of the sufferer or the perpetrator, or you know, you, you're writing from a position which is post-memory, let's say, you know, your, your generation. Like, for example, if you read something like, uh, you know, Art Spiegelman's *Mouse*. Right? I'm sure most of you have read *Mouse*. It's a graphic novel about the Holocaust, uh, and it's interesting how that novel uh, plays out at the beginning. It is also a meta-narrative. Uh, the whole novel, as you know, is a novel about writing a graphic novel on uh, Auschwitz. And initially, the intentions are very shallow. He just wants to write a best-selling novel because he's an American Jew. So obviously, he's using his position. But it's also about the novel which never gets written. So the ending of Mouse is a failure of the project. It's a bit like Eight and a Half, the fill in your film. But it's interesting how, you know, again, we can see how the failure of Mouse is exactly where it succeeds as a literary device. Right? That it fails to become an objective document of Auschwitz and instead it becomes an articulation of the messiness of that violence. And the acceptance of the messiness, the acceptance of the 
entanglement. The articulation of the absence, the messiness, the entanglement is exactly what makes literature such a success story you know, in terms of a memory project, in terms of a memory device, if I should say so. Right? So again, if you're talking about prosthetic memory, uh, you know, we're looking at our smartphones today and saying, oh well, phones remember for us. Uh, you know, social media remembers for us, etc. But so does literature, right? If you want to find out about industrial revolution, I mean, read, you know, William Blake, for example, right? The horrors of industrial revolution uh, is just there in the poetry of William Blake. And, you know, as Pramod and I were saying, uh, we're not, the other thing literature doesn't do is hierarchize, right? We're just saying this is the greatest romantic ever. We just want a vantage point, and then we're looking at a vantage point, and we're looking at the literary representation as a moving medium through which that cultural condition can be represented. Of course, from an affective position, from a narrative position, right? And that, of course, is the part, the final bit that I'm going to conclude with is the whole idea of empathy, right? So, because if, if you're doing memory, if you're remembering something which happened a long time ago, and if you're still moved by it, the reason is literature also becomes uh, some kind of an empathy device, an empathy machine. Because otherwise, why would you really bother, uh, you know, books about people who don't exist, right? So why do you, uh, you know, cry when someone you love in a story dies? We've all done that secretly, maybe, right? When we're growing up, uh, we wanted someone to win, we wanted someone to survive, and, uh, you know, it didn't happen, so it was just uh, cognitive frustration and, you know, just became emotional, and then you cried, right? So, particularly when we're looking at a grotesque event of human violence and tragedy like the partition, empathy becomes a very important thing, right? And we're not talking about empathy as an immediate uh, knee-jerk reaction. We're looking at empathy as an intergenerational a reaction. So we here in 2022, uh, reading about an event which happened in 1947 uh, and maybe a couple of years after that as well. So why is it that we are empathizing, right? Why is it that we are moved by the horror uh, of partition? Whether we're reading Babsa Sidwa or Kushwan Singh or Manu Amal Gongar or Saman Rushdie, whoever that may be, right? In different degrees of literary greatness, they are establishing a relationship of empathy with us, right? And those works of literature, like you said, I mean, you can look at it as a museum of memory, a partition in Lee of a real museum, but also more immediately, and this is, again, the grand project of literature, it becomes an experiment in empathy. So literature, among other things, is also a, a, an experiment in empathy. And the reason why we consider some works of literature great, uh, and one of the, I mean, again, these, these are very subjective things, and you know, one can never say, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a very valid argument which can, you know, make a compelling case of Chetan Bhagat's greatness. Who knows? Right, one can come up with it. So it's just very subjective, right? But I think it's safe to assume that we are moved by, you know, works of literature because of this empathy experience, right? So we are reading something which perhaps never happened. We are reading about characters who don't exist, and we know it. I mean, this is, the, again, the cold region willing suspension of, you know, disbelief, whatever he called it, that we are aware of the fictionality of these characters. No one is telling us that these are people who may have existed. We absolutely know these people didn't exist. We absolutely know there was no madman in Lahore called Toba Teik Singh or Vishen Singh, his real name, right? We absolutely know there's no Salim Sinai. I mean, there can't be any Salim Sinai, right? That's the other thing of magic realism. And that's, again, very political. We, we have a character who biologically can't exist. Right? Not just experientially or culturally, whatever. We, we know a character like that can't exist, like Oscar in a tin drum. Right? So these are like supernatural characters. Uh, and again, I'm looking, I'm using the word supernatural quite close to the way I'm looking at spectrality. So these are, again, very political things. So the supernatural quality of Salim Sinai is exactly what makes him political, right? which makes him very potent as a literary figure in that literary landscape, saying and doing things which are otherwise impossible. Otherwise, not permitted, right? politically not permitted, culturally not permitted. So the subversion lies in the supernatural. Right? That is what exactly makes it subversive in quality. So all these bits, you know, in terms of knowing characters who don't exist, being fully aware of situations which hadn't happened, characters who cannot possibly exist, and still being moved by that. Well, that takes a lot, right? I mean, that exactly is why you know, just going back to this Wolf essay at the beginning, uh, that exactly is why we're still queue up to buy books. We still look at the subjective voice. Uh, 
as a more valid retelling of a political event, right? We still look at the, the phenomenal voice, the emotional phenomenal voice to tell us a story about not just in terms of data about partition, not just in terms of looking at you know, facts and numbers and migrations and how many trains, etc., but about the experience of the horror, right? So the experientiality of literature is the impact empathy bit. So the experientiality and empathy are connected together in that massive and magical narrative device, which we call the novel, right? Which we call the short story. We can give it different kinds of names. And you know, again, if you go back to, and I'm just going to uh, finish with Rushdi here, because I think he's interesting. And also because I'm personally quite moved by what has happened in the last month or so. I think it's just, you know, it's such a symbolic act as well, what happened to him. Uh, we'll not get into that, but uh, just, just tragedy, which is so symbolic in quality as well. But looking at Midnight's Children as a massive experiment in language, uh, an experiment which spawned so many other experiments, uh, it just created a sort of renaissance of writing uh, later on, not just this part of the world, but elsewhere as well. Uh, and again, the, this, this candle of that novel in terms of having a character who biologically can't exist, and still expecting us to empathize with the character, still establishing this relationship of deep empathy. Because again, if you do some uh, you know, research in empathy, there are two kinds of empathy, shallow empathy and deep empathy. In fact, and this is a little bit of a digression, but I think it would make sense. Shallow empathy is useful, I'm using the word useful in a very perverse way, for torture. So and if you do torture studies, uh, so if you know, if the torturer knows how the person will suffer at a shallow empathy level that becomes more effective torture, mental or whatever. But we're talking about deep empathy over here. So literature is an experiment of deep empathy and the entire, you know, the museumization of partition, you know, the real museum being not there, literature becomes a moving museum of partition and also establishing that empathy through different kinds of narrative techniques, focalization. Right? Again, we, we're looking at focalization as a very important narrative device. Uh, it's a term borrowed from camera, as you all know. But uh, you know, the whole idea of the situated storyteller, who is telling the story? Right? And I'm reminded when I'm saying situated storyteller from a cognitive theory point of view, Andy Clark's idea of the situated brain. Right? The situated brain is a magnificent essay. Do read it if you have the time, The Situated Brain by Andy Clark. And I just extend that situated brain into the situated storyteller. So who is the storyteller and where is the storyteller situated? From which point of view is the story getting told? Right? And again, the, the ability, the complex cognitive ability of literature, especially partition literature, to combine different cognitive frameworks the, narrative, the different kinds of narrative frameworks, the perpetrator, the sufferer. I mean, just look at Manto, for example. I mean, the, I think the most radical quality of Manto's story is that he also manages to write stories about people who cause the violence, people actually killed and raped, right? Their point of view. So tomorrow we'll do a story called Cold Meat, a Thunder Ghost, right? Uh, and I'm sure most of you uh, have read it, and we'll read it in some details tomorrow in the workshop as well. But this is the radicality of literature, right? This radicality which transcends morality, which transcends an innate moral point of view, but instead which gives us the human condition of suffering, right? And that humanity of suffering is exactly what makes it such a valid and compelling and moving museum of partition. So my concluding argument here is something I've said already, that we need to take a look at the literature of partition as the museum of partition. We have a museum in Amritsar now, but I think they're secondary. And even that museum is saying that, that we are more interested in oral storytelling. We've, we've had it already in so many grand novels. So literature as a museum of partition, literature as something which enables us to empathize with partition, even today in 2022, so many years down the line. And literature as a fascinating memory project through which we can stylize reality, augment reality, do everything that AR, VR machines do. And you know, looking at partition as something which we, uh, you know, the retelling of that horror over and over again from different points of view and ensuring, most importantly, and this is my final argument, ensuring that it never gets forgotten. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Parvi. We'll have questions, comments.
Monica. Morning. Uh, the question is based on this whole idea of uh, the Bhakshi literature as a kind of museum. So a museum artifact can be used as evidence. So my question is that considering the present political climate, can this evidence from this museum be used in a way that is not perhaps intended by Bhakshi literature as the sort of bolstering of Hinduthwa rhetoric? And again, carrying on the grand narrative of one country, one nation. Yeah, it's a very valid question. And this is exactly, uh, you know, I'm so glad you asked it because I do believe that literary texts uh, are able to animate meanings in ways that uh, the authors may never have designed, right? And again, I mean, we just had a conference uh, where I teach at IIT Madras where someone was talking about uh, exactly something like this. And that reminded me of reader response theory, right? The entire horizon of expectations thing. And of course, the word horizon is very problematic, right? Because horizons keep changing. Uh, horizons are very mutable depending on the, uh, let's say, the ideological impulse of a time, the discursive you know, designs of a time, et cetera. So the same text may be read in ways which can validate violence. Right? The same text may be read in ways which are, I mean, we all know, I mean, the, the how Texts, not just literary texts, but texts of all kinds have been used and co-opted and appropriated for all kinds of reasons. I mean, Himmler's favorite text was Bhagavad Gita, right? You know, and that, that's just just the way it was read uh, to validate certain kinds of you know uh, you know political readings. So the whole point about literature being this fluid medium, and the fluidity uh, is not as free-flowing uh, interplay of meaning. The fluidity can be profoundly political, can be profoundly uh, co-opted and appropriated by political designs. So my answer to your question is absolutely yes. I mean, that is one of the problems of literature as well. I mean, if you call that a problem, but I, I don't necessarily call that a problem. I, I call that the narrative possibility of literature, right? And possibility is an amoral word. Uh, possibility doesn't have uh, any morality to it. Possibility can find this morality in and out. So depending on how the reader is responding to it, depending on how the horizon is constructed around that text, we can have all kinds of interpretations, all kinds of use. So again, I mean, there have been a lot of uh, research on uses of literature, right? Again, the word use is very problematic. But I think you're quite right. I mean, literary texts, and these have historically happened also. Literary texts have been used uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, situating them apropos of certain ideological frameworks, certain political frameworks. And that is same for, I mean, that is something which is true for memory as well. Because, you know, we who are sort of students of memory studies, we increasingly realize that collective memory has really nothing to do with the past. Uh, it's all about how the past is recreated to fit the present to forge the future. Right? So there's this futuristic quality of memory, collective memory. So how will you design the future, politically, culturally, discursively? And that depends on what you're choosing to recreate, what you're choosing to reconstruct. Right? So, so going back in time and reconstructing things, whether architecturally or you know, through art or literature or language, whatever the case may be, has much more to do with the impetus towards the future, right? What kind of a future you want for the collective, the collective combination, religion, language, all kinds of collective you know, entities can be you know, used in that way in terms of looking at the futuristic quality, what is remembered. So if you're defining literature as a memory project, if you're defining literature as a memory artifact, it just opens itself up for that kind of a co-opted category as well, that how do you pick on it selectively, metonymically, that's something I should have mentioned, Right, not just the metaphoricity of literature, but the metonymic quality of literature as well. You just sort of cherry pick your sections and then use that uh, to connect to a certain impulse of the present in order to design the future which is to come. So, yeah. Any other questions? The workshop participants? This is your chance. You're supposed to be filled with questions. Or you can save yourself for tomorrow as well, yeah. Um, not more of a question, it's like a, it's an addition. Um, Ili Wiesel, he's a, he's a Holocaust, was a Holocaust survivor. So uh, he particularly was very much against uh, museumization. And he often said that uh, once people, like he was basically against these particular two, that was uh, Auschwitz uh, Museum and the Bad uh, Yeshim uh, Museum had started, Yad Vashim, sorry. Uh, 
And uh, so he was into that once people start connecting with such things, the materialistic, uh, the, the utensils, the, uh, the footwear which were piled up. So he said that it in a way leads on to the homogenization mm -hmm. and it also does lessens the pain. And um, even for instance, if I say my uh, grandparents have been partition survivors, refugees, and so the pain that they have felt, I cannot say that I can connect to it. Yeah. Yeah, so in a way, like maybe that's also a reason why India did not have a partition museum maybe for so long, so that we do not start generalizing the pain, we do not start generalizing the terror. So like just a Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I completely agree. So see, I, I did mention uh, the idea of traumatic memory and narrative memory uh, uh, briefly, I think maybe I should expand on that a little bit more. But even if you read Maus, you know, uh, no, Spiegelman's Maus, we have Vladek, Ati's father, who's just refusing to tell the story. And he deliberately mixes up the details. He deliberately ensures it's a failed project, right? So the entire Maus is about the failed graphic novel about the Holocaust in a way. And therein lies the complexity, the cognitive complexity. So absolutely spot on when you're saying, I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, so you're absolutely spot on when you're saying that there is that moral dilemma about memory as well, right? Because, and this connects to the earlier question, very interesting, because once it's out there, as a, in a public device, in a public domain, that can just be co-opted in all kinds of ways uh, to validate certain kinds of movements, political, ideological, whatever, uh, to mobilize a certain momentum. And so that, again, becomes a, a very uh, complex subject to touch on. And this is why I think literature, the entire literary museum, in a way, is perhaps more complex than a museum about actual artifacts, right? Because literature, the fluidity of literature, the ontological complexity of literature uh, makes museumization perhaps less homogeneous than what a real physical museum would. But that's a very, very valid question. Thank you. something with regards to Indian writings in English yeah. specifically. So uh, with language being a hindrance of propaganda and propagation in general, it makes me wonder when uh, we are using the language of the colonizer yeah. um, helplessly in order to cater to a larger audience, uh, such as that of Rashti or let's say A.K. Ramanujan with obituary or whatever, uh, to what degree can we vouch for the authenticity of this experience is when uh, language can have a major cultural impact uh, with regards to how we can share our experiences. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I, I can't agree more because I, and I think I realized later uh, that I picked Manto for the workshop tomorrow who wrote entirely in Urdu, right? Maybe it was a subconscious choice because I think regional writings about partition probably has uh, a viscerality to it which in English probably doesn't. So again, I'm not trying to get into the politics of language way up, but you're quite right. Uh, you know, people who suffered, you know, and their language, you know, that communication model, that narrative model, would probably have more valency and more viscerality, right, compared to uh, a, a language which is, uh, you know, again, I'm not trying to make it into an Indian, non-Indian thing because you know one can always argue. The English is probably also an Indian language, but you know I completely get your point in terms of looking at the the, the location of that trauma, you know, the local language, the local uh, site of the trauma, and how that is perhaps best represented by the language which emerges from that location, right? And again, this is something I briefly touched upon when I said this is why I think people are making up spaces. You know, so we talk about Toba Take saying, uh, you know, the Kushan Singh novel. Uh, so in order to hyper-localize, so the fictionality of the space is also hyper-localization. So it's such a local space that doesn't exist in a public discourse. It's just for that people. It's just for the sentiment of those people. So I think it's also a sentimental space. Toba Take Singh is a sentimental space. Uh, Kushan Singh's novel has a sentimental space. So I think that sentiment uh, connected to that language uh, is perhaps, uh, you know, as you very correctly argue, uh, perhaps a more immediate and a more authentic depiction of the horror that took place. Uh, what I'm trying to do over here is uh, looking at English not so much as a medium of communication, but it's just another way 
literature can be written. And I'm quite aware that this project is IWE, so I'm trying to fit that as well. But I do realize later, and maybe I should have, it was too late for me to retract, that I actually have Manto for tomorrow, who never wrote in English, right? And all we're gonna to read tomorrow are translations. But it just seems to be the most obvious choice for me. If we talk about partition, I would pick Manto over Rushdie any day, right? Because I think the, uh, and I did talk about the minimalism of Manto. I mean, this hardly any matter for the knife is a knife. Uh, the cut body is a cut body. There's no symbolic significance that it has beyond what is out there. And that barrenness of language that Manto has is exactly what makes it so poignant. And I don't think that could ever be achieved uh, in a language which is not immediately tied to that particular space. So the Urdu of Manto is the most authentic medium of representation, I think. Thank you. Partition literature, a lot of partition literature consists of autobiographies, right? Yes. Uh, so these autobiographies that are uh, written mainly in regional languages, uh, they are often written in the aftermath of uh, the partition, like um, when they are looking back at the events. So how does uh, memory work there and how is it different from the fiction of Mando which has more urgency to it? Right, it's a very interesting question because the the borders between autobiography and fiction are quite slippery, right? And you know, I think Rollabat has it absolutely spot on when his autobiography is called Rollabat by Rollabat, right? And the first line of that autobiography is this should be read as a novel. So I think the autobiography is obviously a very selective enterprise. It's very metonymic, and also notice how it has all the structural conditions that fiction has, you know, metonymy, uh, you know, the selective quality, the focal point, you know, the, the perspective of the storyteller, the situated storyteller who is telling the story, etc. So as a memory project, the autobiography is obviously biased, you know, it's auto, that auto bit is just out there, right? So I think one needs to take a look at autobiography and fiction, obviously, as different genres, uh, I'm absolutely certain of that, but also, the affective quality of a good autobiography is not very dissimilar, I think, to the affective quality of a good novel, because both would move you, the reader, right? And the whole point, because if someone were to write an autobiography about partition, what would be uh, the elements in it, right? It would all obviously be the moving elements, or you know, it would obviously be the domestic elements which suddenly got transformed uh, in certain ways. And if it's a really good autobiography, it would be a combination of the domestic staid structure with the suddenly volatile structure and how that, that can be juxtaposed together. But what we see here is as a cognitive, affective, narrative experiment, the autobiography and a work of fiction are actually boring and very similar frameworks in certain ways, right? So to answer your question, I think regional autobiography, and this connects back to the earlier question as well about regional language, I think those obviously have a degree of valency which probably are more uh, valid, more potent, more compelling than, let's say, novels written in English many, many years after partition, right? This, those have an immediacy to it, uh, an experiential quality to it. But uh, what was fascinating for me in your question, I think it was a really good bit, was how some of the autobiographies are written much later, right? It's not just a knee-jerk reaction to what happened. There's a selection process involved. There's a condensation process involved. There's a latency period involved. And all those things lend themselves to the narrative framework, right? What gets into an autobiography? See, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, novels and autobiographies and any act of narration is a bit like map making, right? When you make a map, you decide what gets in, what gets out. There are borders in a map. So every novel would have its borders. Every autobiography will have its borders. Not all the utensils in the kitchen will get in. Some would, some wouldn't, right? Uh, those with symbolic valency would get in. And again, it depends on the focal point of the narrator, right? So I think uh, the latency of those autobiographies, as very correctly pointed out, that is what perhaps makes it more selective in quality, more careful in quality, and which lends itself to a richer narrative structure than, let's say, an immediate autobiography written at that very point of time, right? So, yeah. So you had mentioned that Adorno has been misquoted, that he says, 
you sh should not write poetry about ostriches. I think if ostriches exist, then literature about ostriches should also exist. Mm -hmm. Because literature, if literature does not go to places where suffering is, then what else will? Yeah. And also in the essay of Wolf that you mentioned, even though it's true that she's talking about the cinematic medium, she's also trying to say without saying that literature should start going places. Yes, places absolutely, absolutely. But to be honest, I mean, he didn't really say, I mean, it's one of the famous mistranslations in history, he didn't really say there's no poetry after Auschwitz. He said it's barbaric to write poetry after Auschwitz, or lyric after Auschwitz, and he did retract it later as well. Uh, well, apropos of, and I completely agree with you in terms of how literature actually, if literature doesn't, who would, right? Uh, that stylized narrative framework which can bring in emotions, affect politics, architecture, everything together into one form is the, perhaps the best experiment invented by in the human mind uh, in terms of time traveling. I mean, what better way to time travel than read a novel about someplace? Just go back in time and remember it and relive it in certain ways. Now, apropos of your uh, next question, uh, can, you, can you rephrase it a little bit, the next bit that you asked? Wolf, uh, how she was saying literature should go. Uh, so even even yeah. though Wolf's essay was primarily about the cinematic medium, yeah. uh, I think she was also trying to say without saying that if literature is to survive, yeah. it should start going places. Exactly. It cannot afford to you know, linger around comfort zones because new media are arriving to replace functions right. like that. Absolutely. And, and also notice how literature becomes so cinematic at that time. I mean, the modernism is so cinematic. And people like Eliot and Wolfe and Joyce are heavily drawing on that content, that visual grammar, certainly have long shots and close-ups. I mean, think of something like Wasteland. I mean, the way London is depicted, the way Thames is depicted, it has to be so cinematic. Eliot obviously was a keen watcher of cinema. And interestingly, I mean, the bit that I perhaps should have mentioned, the one film that Wolf mentions in that essay that she is watching is a German expressionist film called The Cabin of Dr. Caligari. Has anyone seen that film? It's a black and white film about German expressionism and, uh, you know, people like, uh, lots of people have uh, written about that film as well in terms of how that is seen sometimes culturally as a fear of imminent Nazism, you know, this rise of the Nazis. And, um, you know, so, in fact, there's this really interesting book called From Caligari to Hitler, just forgetting the name of the person who's written it. I'm sure Pramod will remind me later. Uh, from Caligari to Hitler. Uh, it's a fascinating book. But that figure of Caligari, which, which gets represented in the film by Robert Wayne, that Wolf is watching, uh, you know, that is obviously not accidental that Wolf is watching that film. But what she says in that little episode is that how a flicker on the screen can do so much. Right. And you're quite right. Because uh, if, if you read Wolf's writing subsequent to that essay, right, and she obviously changes course and the writing becomes so cinematic to the lighthouse and some of her later writings, uh, it just borrows so heavily from cinema as well. So, yeah. But I think it's interesting because w what we see in the early 20th century is this paranoia about this new art forms, right? Uh, so cinema, the gramophone, which is a little bit earlier, uh, but also uh, photography, you know, in terms of how we all know when photography first came into being, uh, there was this cultural paranoia about photography, that if the camera steals your soul, etc., etc., which I find very interesting because uh, when the first commercial, uh, you know, availability of Kodak happened, it was just a year before uh, Oscar Wilde wrote The Picture of Dorian Gray, right? And you know, Wilde was a very keen photographer, and if you look at Wilde, I mean, he's just got photographed all the time. So the other, the, the important thing I think both of us are engaging with here is literature is always borrowed from different medium, and that is why we still read novels. It's just it's such a fascinating, fluid, ontological framework, which is borrowed from cinema, painting, different kinds of art forms, uh, and still remains to this day our favorite storytelling device, I think. So. I think we'll keep the rest of the questions for the workshop component because we have another lecture coming up at 12.15. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Parvi, for that wonderful lecture, which was at the same time specific yet a very broad survey of partition literature, a wonderful, as in a really a, a medium with lots of writers, lots of texts in several languages. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.